Welcome to the Christian Men at Work podcast, where I interview men from all walks of life with varying job titles who have one thing in common. They are all choosing daily to live out their Christian faith through their work, and because of that, they are leading, prospering, glorifying God, and experiencing joy and purpose in their work, and you can too. Men at Work, welcome to episode 27. Today I'm going to be interviewing Ken Helzer. Before we get to that interview, I have a few brief announcements. My book, Jesus is at Work, Having Joy and Purpose at Your Current Job, has been recorded in audio format and submitted to ACX, uh, which is a part of Audible. And this should be available in the next couple of weeks on Audible. As soon as it is, I will post a link to that at DaveHilgendorf.com. I am continuing to release new episodes of Wednesday Work Advice every Wednesday on my YouTube channel, so check that out. And I am also excited about starting up a nine-month journey, being a part of the Colson Fellows Discipleship Training that's kicking off in the next couple weeks. Um, Won't get into much detail on that. I'm just very excited about it. And I, wa- I will say one thing, that one of the assignments is to, re- is to read or listen to Mere Christianity. And if any of you have never read or heard that by C.S. Lewis, or maybe you already have, as I had, but um, am really getting a lot out of uh, listening to it again, I encourage you to check that out. So today we're going to talk with a very, very special, very unique man, by the name of Ken Helzer. And just uh, before I introduce him, I wanted to give you a little sneak peek that um, Ken has uh, been gracious enough to to let me play one of his songs that he recorded a number of years ago, and so I'll be playing that at the end of the interview. Ken is a native Carolinian, a musician, songwriter, artist, writer, and storyteller. He simply refers to himself as a communicator. Once a successful recording star and performer with several hit records, the do-your-own-thing lifestyle of party, sex, alcohol, and drugs of the 60s caused him to ask, is this all there is? The turning point came when smoking dope, practicing yoga, he picked up a Bible and read, Why do you work for that which never satisfies? Here in your soul shall live. From Isaiah 55, verse 2 and 3. Ken did hear God's voice when the Lord said, You cannot have two masters. Your God is music. Ken said enough and gave Christ Jesus the reins to his heart and the rest of his life. Now, almost 46 years later, he and his family reside at a small retreat ministry in Sophia, North Carolina, called A Place in the Heart. They travel all over the world proclaiming that life begins by hearing God's voice and that God wants to speak even more than man wants to hear. The most powerful thing about Ken's life is his willingness to be honest and transparent, which is real Christianity, not religion. Ken is open about his past and says that though once his wife was healed of cancer, the greatest miracle of all is healing the pain of rejection in the human heart. In his own word, Ken states, I'm an artist because my father let me see his beauty. I'm a songwriter because he let me hear his song. I'm a teacher because he let me hear the secrets of his heart. You see, it's not really me, but Christ in me, the hope of glory. Let's get right to our interview with Ken Helzer. Hey, Ken, thanks a lot for joining this uh, discussion today. I wanted to start by just asking you to give us a little bit of history about your life before becoming a Christian and then how you, how you became a Christian. Man, you're asking for a volume. <laughs> very, very briefly. <clears throat> I, you know, you always seek to try to find out, well, how in the world did I get so messed up? But I think one of the things that happened is um, <clears throat> as a kid, I was bullied. I was a skinny little kid. I had this stomach thing that I could throw up in a heartbeat. And my mother nearly lost me as a kid. They wanted to do surgery 
So in the first grade, when Mama lied to me and told me that I would love school, and I walked in Miss Han's first grade at Fred Olds Elementary in Raleigh, North Carolina, and this guy named Buddy Myers, who died last year, I can't believe it, but anyway, he said, ooh, and then my mother made me wear knickers, which are these things that reveal your legs. I begged her to let me wear long pants. He said, look at the boy. He's got toothpicks for legs. What's your name, boy? And I said, well, my name is Kenny. He said, well, we're going to call you Skinny. And what's your last name? I said, Helser. He said, well, from now on, you are Skinny Helka Seltzer. And I will never forget the incredible humiliation, embarrassment. And so I was picked on. Skinny little kid, skinny hulk of stuff, a funny German name. And in the fifth grade, uh, they had a little talent show, and I got up and did an Elvis Presley imitation of, you ain't nothing but a hound dog, or just a cry. And all of a sudden, people realized I could imitate people. And I became a singer and joined a nine-piece black group in 1963 right out of high school. That was my dream come true. And uh, years go by. I, I had a couple of successful records. and was quite an entertainer and, and ended up in a preacher's office because I was under so much conviction of my sin, of my lifestyle and everything. And I started reading the Bible, smoke dope, read the Bible, very successful group getting ready to do a tour with the Almond Brothers and Leonard Skinner and something called Southern Rock. And the long and short is I ended up in a preacher's office trying to know how do I hear the voice of God. And after he talked for two hours of an incredible story after story of the voice of the Lord, I said, can I hear God like that? And he said, no. And I said, why? He said, because your God is music. And in a very piercing, prophetic way that looked right into my deepest part of my being, I said, what do you mean my God is music? I don't worship music. He said, anything you look to for your identity, becomes the, you become the slave to. That's the God you really serve. Only God Almighty, Jesus Christ, can give you your identity. And I realized all my life I had tried to cover up that crazy little skinny Kenny Helka such a kid and music became and that day on May the nineteenth of nineteen seventy, I resigned my band, I just resigned my career and gave Jesus the rest of my life and that was soon to be forty eight years ago. Now that's that's pretty quick what I just gave to you. <laughs> that was fast. <laughs> so you did have one of those moments. Not every Christian can speak to a moment like that, but how how can you talk a little bit about how did your life change right after that? I mean, you, you said you made some dramatic changes. You you got out of the band. And in what other ways did your life just dramatically yeah, change? There was all, there's another thing, too, Dave, that I think a lot of people don't talk about is that when you run away from God, because I knew him as a little child. I walked the aisle when I was 11, 12 years old in Baptist church, and I really had deep, deep conviction of right and wrong. And I hurt. I, I was scared of God. So this thing has been building up. I'm 25 years of age when this happened. So one thing that, that makes it dramatic change is that I finally came home. In fact, I called my mother that about 30 minutes after I left his office at Florida Street Baptist Church in Greensboro, North Carolina. Reverend Jack Wilder, he looked like a narcotics agent. I'll never forget it. I was so profoundly changed because finally, after all those years, I had quit running and I called my mom and I said, Mom, I just want you to know, and I was searching for words what to say. I just said, Mommy, your little boy came home. And my mother cried. She said, you know, I prayed eight and one half years for this moment, this day. So the dramatic change is when you've been convicted and running away from truth all that long, immediately, there is such incredible relief and joy and exuberance. And because you finally resolve what you've been running from all your life. So the change in my life, one of the greatest changes was I followed through with what I committed to. I told the Lord, I'm going to resign my band this day. 
But when I went over to the band that I was the lead singer, I was the performer, I was writing the music we'd recorded in New York City. Um, I was in negotiation with Dick Clark to do, do something in California. I had met him personally and all of the things that I've been working on and then to give it up in one afternoon. And the band laughed at me. They thought I was crazy. They thought I'd done too much LSD or something. I said, no, guys, I'm really serious. I, and so one of, they began to mock. <laughs> was a guy in the band said, yeah, God said, leave that rock and roll, roll along, baby. You'll burn. You'll burn in hell. They all just laughing. And I said, Lord, help me. I was, it was awkward. I was embarrassed. I was intimidated. And a light out of heaven itself filled that room with light. And the whole band came under conviction. And in that band, two guys died tragically. Um, and then two guys went to federal prison. And three of us became Christians. So automatically, dramatically that day. And then the most dramatic thing, and most life-changing thing was not just leaving the music world. But I had been committing adultery for three and a half years against my precious wife, Linda. And I'd hidden most of it. And um, I went home and I walked in the door. And she said she will never forget that. She said, I thought you were at band practice. And later she told me, she says, when you walked that door, you were not, you were not the same person that left that morning. She did not know I'd gone to visit a a preacher and a uh, preacher I don't like to say he was the pastor he was a man who loved God but when I walked in the door I said look we need to have a talk and she was like I can't believe what I'm looking at and I said Linda I have given my life to Jesus and with the help of God if you want me to confess all everything I've done and all the chicks I've run around on I will but with the help of God I want to be the father these two little girls have never had I want to be the husband that you've never known and the greatest miracle of my life is that Linda forgave me that day, has never, ever, in the last 48 years since this happened, she has never, ever thrown my past up in my face. And that's the greatest gift and the greatest miracle I know of, is to be totally forgiven. And from there, everything had a whole new everything about life. And I can go on about how we got involved and and then I didn't have a job I had five years of college but I switched curriculums three times so that doesn't help when you go from engineering at North Carolina State to drama at UNCG you lose a lot of credit <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I can imagine and thanks for your authenticity and uh, one thing I wanted to say too was um, your uh, the, the fact that you had been given truth as a child um, I was just thinking that's probably an encouragement to anyone who's listening who maybe has some kids that have who have gone away from the Lord. Um, but certainly you, you were you were raised to know Christ. Is that true? Absolutely. I even yeah. I even think I had a vision one time of the Lord in in the clouds. I can't remember because I was only four or five, but I I can remember exactly where it was. And um, but then again. I, I'm an artist, so I've always been an artist, and it took me a long time to discover what an artist is, but an artist is a person who's been given incredible imagination and sensitivity, a lot of emotion and a lot of sensitivity. The, what makes a person an artist, though, is he's not content to live with all that feeling and emotion and imagination and sensitivity. He wants to express it to other people. When I realized the one thing I wanted more than anything else in this life is to be a communicator. And I, I paint, I write, I do music, I write music, I did drama. But, you know, the bottom line is I just always wanted to express those deep things inside. So, so part of what happened, Dave, is when I, when I came to Christ, all those dreams and imaginations started going in the light instead of all the stuff I did in the darkness, making music and making money and everything else. And we ended up in High Point, North Carolina. Um, I was to give a little talk on a Sunday afternoon with a group called the New Directions, one of these singing groups out of Burlington, North Carolina. And J.L. Williams called me and he said, would you just give a little talk of your testimony? And at a park, this thing they did day in the park in High Point. And I gave about a 10-minute talk, and this man was standing in the back, and he 
Kyle came up to me and said, can I see you? Uh, I, I would like to get together with you. His name was Tom Watson. He had ghosts. He, when he died, he had ghost written 93 books. He was an incredible, brilliant man. Went back to seminary at Duke after several degrees, journalism degree. And he reached out to the worst of the worst of the worst kids in the city of High Point. The drug problem in High Point in 1968, 69, 70, nobody wanted to recognize it. It was some of the richest kids in the city. And he invited me to come to work with him in this old rundown building they called the Kumbaya Coffee House. That sounds 70s. And I went to work with them because I had no job. We keep, we ended up keeping three or four runaway girls in our home. One of them had chronic hepatitis. She was 17 years old, flaming red hair. Her name was Martha, and she was pushing drugs in the local high school, and the city of High Point did not want to recognize they had a drug problem. And that's what we did. We worked with the absolute worst of the worst. And um, now you talk about life changes. I went from being a star on stage, sang one time with Neil Diamond in front of 22,000 people in Montgomery, Alabama, to going to working with these runaway kids. And, and also, something I told my wife, I said, I'm going to learn how to be the father and learn how to be a husband. And boy, those days... Those days were my seminary. I thought I was going to go to seminary, and uh, I figured, growing up in a Baptist church, if you're going to be in, if you're going to follow Jesus, then you need to go to seminary and get a degree, and probably be a preacher in a church. and And I didn't want to do any of that, but I, that's what I thought I had to do. And I got a phone call from this woman. This was a life changing experience because I did a television show where people were asking me questions. A lot of people want to know, what, what, why did you quit the band? You run at the peak of your career. And so I, I gave this television thing, and she saw it, and, and she owned a Firestone store in Thomasville, North Carolina. I didn't know who she was. Back then, I didn't hide my phone number. She could look it up in the phone book in High Point. And she called me, and she said, um, so you will be going to seminary. And I said, what do you mean I'll be going? She said, God has revealed to me you're going to seminary. I said, well, that's what I said. So she said, but it's not the seminary southeastern up in Wake Forest. You're going to go to the seminary of life. I said, well, where's that? She says, everywhere you go. At that point, I thought, this woman is kooky. She's crazy. She's lost her mind. Here's one of these religious fanatics. And I said, okay, so does it um, have a professor? She says, oh, he has one. His name is Holy Spirit. I said, well, do they have a library? She said, 66 books. And I'm starting to laugh my head off at this crazy woman. And she said, I want to ask you. She said, I want to tell you something. She said, God is looking for people who can prove the gospel. Now, I'm about two or three weeks old, and all I know is you can't prove anything. It's all by faith. And I said, ma'am, I'm sorry, but you can't prove the gospels by faith. She didn't pay any attention to me. She says, did you go to college? I said, five years. She said, well, do you remember the scientific method? And I said, yes. She said, well, give it to me in a nutshell. Scientific method is you have an idea for it to become a theory. You have to take your idea into the laboratory and put it to every conceivable test. Then you come out with a theory. She said, that's what God's looking for. I said, what do you mean? He said, God is looking for people who will take the idea of truth, the word of truth, everything Jesus said, and take it into the laboratory called life and put it to a test to see if it really works. And then when you come through the test, you can say with authority of life experience, this I know. And that's the seminary of life you've been called to. And here I am, soon to be 48 years later, and every day of my life is going out to the seminary of life to see if it works. So you can't know anything beyond your experience. And I, people have a little hard time. They say, what do you mean beyond you? You can't trust experience. I didn't say you trust experience. What I'm saying is when you apply the truths of God to everyday living, you experience whether they're real or not. And I will say every truth of God that I've applied to life as I've learned it has never failed. And I know with experience 
Example being, my wife and I, when we left the music world, I left a lot of money. I even lost money on royalties. I lost money with equipment we had. I gave it all up. And we began a life of faith. That's been a long time. And you can tell me it's more blessed to give than to receive, and I can receive that as information. I can say, yes, I like that. I believe that. I know where it's found. I can quote it to you. But after 47 years of living a life of faith and having that experience, I don't just know it in my head. I know it from my life's experience and the reality of my life. Am I going on too long? <laughs> <laughs> no, you're good. Uh, I'm not giving that, you any. I, I was, I'm not giving you any opportunity to ask me questions because I'm just rambling <laughs> on. Well, I was just about to ask you to give me an example of you living out that truth, and and that's I can't think of a better example. So that's a good one. And I guess one of the ways you've been living out um, this seminary is through Place in the Heart Ministries. Can you talk a little bit about how that got started and what God has been doing yeah. through you over the years there, including your involvement i know with your son jonathan well two weeks or so after i became gave him my heart and having no idea where we're going following him i really had this strong impression now i know it was a vision but i didn't know what a vision was because i'm too young i'm I'm, I, i lack everything just about i'm learning to follow Jesus, but i had this impression and I could, I could see it in a way that we were going to end up with a piece of land one day. Now, it took from that time in 1970 to 1986, it took 16 years for that thing to become a reality, but I never forgot it. And we had an opportunity to purchase 52 acres of land, and we raised the money for it. And that was, and we purchased on April the 15th of 1986. It was 52 acres. I had already set up a nonprofit corporation, and we had no idea what to do except I thought we were going to build some kind of a retreat. And Jonathan was eight years old. Now, Jonathan's another story, but I'll just briefly catch it up. He watched me walk this piece of land because we live close to it. And he watched me with tears walk this piece of land. And he said, Daddy, you always had your heart in that piece of land. And when he graduated from high school, went off to YWAM and came back, he asked me at 19 years of age, he said, Daddy, can I walk alongside you? I said, what do you mean? He said, I want to work with you, Daddy. And that was amazing to me. And we, at that time, we only had a couple of buildings. And we would have prayer meetings down here. And we have day retreats. And we did something called a pig picking, which was we would cook some pigs, and we got a donation of coleslaw, and we made this hush puppy maker, and we did pinto beans in these great big black cauldrons. And to the 250 people that helped us buy the land, we gave away a barbecue pig picking, southern pig picking, and fed these folks. And I set up a little trailer with a small PA system, and my daughter and I sang, and we ministered. And people loved it. So the next year, we asked them to pray for us to help us get a build a building. The next year, we had about 500 people, and we had a and probably a $200,000 building that we built for $78,000 and paid cash for it. We had enough money after the pig picking to do a cement slab. After that, we had enough money to buy some two-by-fours. Then we put a roof on the place. And the next year, we celebrated the fact that we had a beautiful building built to house the ministry and it was paid for. And everything we've done has been that way. We've used what we had at hand and pay cash as we go along. And now my son, last two years ago, on April the 15th of 2016, 30 years later, I turned everything that we had built and done over the years over to my son, Jonathan, and his wife, Melissa, and um, they now run the thing. It's called, uh, the, they have a group called the Cageless Birds, and their ministry has gone all over the world as phenomenal. And a lot of it has been because of the music, too. But, um, yeah, all, but I tell you something that's amazing. All four of my children have gone past me. I have a, the, Jonathan's little sister, Sarah, is a nationally known artist, and I've always been an artist. My daughter, my oldest daughter, Dusty, is a dreamer like her daddy, and she has built this place called The Table, 
farmhouse bakery in Ashboro, and it is booming. Now she's got a, practically a city block that she's working to redo. It's changing the face of Ashboro. My other daughter is a writer. So all the four things I've been a writer, a dreamer, a, an artist, and a musician, all my children have gone past me. And I, you can't ask for At 73 years of age, I could not ask for anything more from the Lord Jesus than that my children have gone past me. So that's what we do here. <laughs> now, if you want to know about Jonathan, that's another story. But I'm, I'm gonna let, I will be quiet. And let you ask the question. <laughs> well, I will throw in a plug for the table. That's some good food there. I'll, I'll tell you that. <laughs> um, and I have been to Place for the Heart. I've been to a men's conference, and and uh, and I've heard Jonathan and you perform uh, several times. But for those, maybe for those uh, who listening who aren't familiar with, with Jonathan Helzer's music, can you talk a little bit about that? Man, I'm going to try to be brief. Uh, <laughs> my wife was diagnosed with cancer of the uterus in 1976, and we already had two grown children, grown meaning 12 and 10. Uh, we were looking forward to the time that we could leave and I could go out on the road to travel, so that I did. Started doing YWAM schools all over, and I wanted Linda to go with me. And uh, we had no plans for any more children. We're two weeks away from a hysterectomy that the doctors hope will take care because it was so rather severe. They did five tests. All of them were cancerous. And a prophet came to me named Kermit Hall from Thomasville. I, I hardly knew him. And he said, the Lord appeared to me, and he wanted me to tell you, first of all, he's healed your seat. And I did enough drugs for two and a half years that I didn't want any more children. And he said, the Lord told me to tell you he's healed your seed. You will have a son. His name will be Jonathan David. He will play the harp. He will sing like an angel. And he will write songs for his generation that will go all over the world. Now, when you were looking at a hysterectomy to save your wife's life, that is really far out. And I asked the Lord for a, a sign. I said, God, I need something more than this. And this man said, oh, yeah, I've never met your wife. He did not know we were two weeks from hysterectomy. He said, I saw your wife picking daisies along the side of the road. You stopped, and she was going, love me, love me not. That flower doesn't count and throw it down. And that happened to us uh, several months before we were married. That exact thing, side of the road. Linda says, pull over. She saw the field of days. And I went, wow, God, this has to be you. I prayed for her, anointed her with oil. It was not emotional. It was on a Sunday, and I asked the doctor, would he please do one more test? He said, I've already done five. And I told him about the vision, and he was a believer. He said, okay, we'll go in on Friday. I'll do one more test. I'll scrape the wound. Uh, that's a severe test. It's surgical. And we'll keep her in the hospital over the weekend so we can do the hysterectomy on Monday unless something dramatically has taken place. They did that on Friday. They put her to sleep. Saturday morning, we heard him whistling down the hall, Dr. Kent Bennett. And Linda said, that's a good sign. He's whistling. He stuck his face his, in the door with the biggest smile. He said, the pathologist is baffled. Your wife is 200% okay. And wait six weeks before you start working on that baby Jonathan. And he laughed. And later we found out he told one of his nurses, he said, I've been in practice for 30 some 40 years. This is the first bona fide miracle I've ever seen. This is Linda has been healed by God. And we had a Jonathan David a year and a half later. We did not tell him that he was to play music. We did not tell him that he was going to have music all over the world. We just told him that God had done a miracle on his mother, and we had him. And it was 18 and a half, 19 years. He asked me one day, his senior year of high school, did I play guitar? And I said, yep. He said, would you teach me some chords? I went up in the attic, got an old guitar, taught him everything I knew. He went off to YWAM, and when I went to visit him in YWAM in England, Lynn and I did, the last day of the school before we flew home, kids around him say, hey, Jonathan, play, play your mom and dad one of those songs, one of those songs. Well, I knew he was starting to lead worship, and he played this unbelievable song, and I said, Jonathan, who wrote that? I thought it was Delirious or somebody. 
He said, well, I did, Daddy. Do you like it? And I just about lost it because I had waited 19, well, with the years of the pregnancy and all, I'd waited 20 plus years to see the word of a prophet come true in our life. And that was only the beginning. Last year, his song, No Longer Slaves to Fear, was given a Dove Award. And that song truly has gone all over the world. And, um, yep, that's that's what God did. <laughs> That's awesome, and I love that song. That is a great song. Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, you and your wife have taught over the years that life begins when you hear God's voice, and that's been a big part of your mission. Um, can you talk about why that's so important that we hear God's voice and some uh, suggestions as to how you hear God's voice and how, how others can hear God's voice? Yeah, that I really appreciate you asking that question because that probably I was with several people here at our home yesterday who pastors who came to visit and and they asked me the exact same question and the answer for me is so simple is you cannot have a relationship with somebody without communication. I mean, the key to relationship is communication. And you build relationship out of communication. And so early, even before I became a Christian, I read this verse. It was the verse that probably most changed my life. Isaiah 55, 3, that says, Hear, comma, and your soul shall live. And I said, Hear what? I'm talking to myself. I'm doing yoga. I'm smoking marijuana. So I'm kind of looped a little bit, but... Anyway, I just said, hear what? And I'm reading the Bible at the same time. I said, hear what? And the voice way down deep said, hear God. And I started going from church to church when our band was out playing. I'd get up early in the morning, which is 10 o'clock, and be there at 11. And I never could, I'd ask people, do you hear God? Does God speak to you? And nobody ever gave an answer. And I began to reason, well, how can you have a relationship with someone that you never hear? So I saw for several months somebody who could tell me how to hear God because I figured if God would speak to me, I would know he was real and I could have a relationship. So the day that I gave my heart to the Lord, I, I began to ask, seek, and knock. And one of the things I learned in everything, God has a voice. And I thought I was going to hear some kind of audible, this is God. God, number one, speaks most in Scripture. You cannot read the Bible without his voice coming through because it's his word. Number two, Francis Assisi says creation is God's second book. And I absolutely know beyond a shadow of a doubt, that, especially living out here in Sophia in the woods and, every, and having a garden. And every time I pull a weed up out of the ground, I look at my own heart. And I see all the weeds that the enemy has sown inside of me, and it's my job. Anyway, I, I have practice. I love this. Graham Cook one time was asked, how did you get to hear God so good? And Graham Cook laughed, and he said, practice. But that's the thing I have practiced more than anything else. And I've asked, I said, Lord, teach me how to hear you in everything that happens, in every circumstance of life. And if you ask, and if you seek, and if you knock, he says, by that simple process, it'll happen. And now all the time people say, well, how do you hear God? I said, well, you ask him, Lord, would you please speak to me in a way that I will know your voice? And John 10, Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. Above all other voices, they know my voice, and they don't listen to the voice of another. And I practiced on that, and it's life to me, and Jesus said this. He said, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. And God wants to speak to us more than we want to listen. We have everything in our favor. All we have to do is be open to hear, ask to know him by his voice, and say, Lord, open my ears. Of the ear. You know, there's a song, open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. Well, open the ears of my heart, too, because I want to hear you more than anything in all of life. I want to hear the voice of God. 
I think one reason people don't want to hear God is they're scared of what he's going to say. Because they got an image of God. He's always going to do is just beat them up for being bad. He's going to condemn them. God has unfailing love. You know, through the mercy, through the cross, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, he wants to get to us. And the best way in the world for God to just come in and work and reveal himself and have intimacy with him is through his force. Oh, man, you got me on a subject I could talk about all day. <laughs> well, and I and I, I know we could um, dig into this more, and I've heard you talk about journaling. I know that's a part of, of hearing from, from God. But if you don't mind, I wanted to ask you a, a different question. Um, sure. And that has to do with uh, authenticity. Um, you, you were, you know, shared some of your, your testimony earlier. And I've heard you said that uh, true Christianity is, is being authentic. Um, I, hopefully I said that correctly. Um, can you talk about what you mean by that and why in the body of Christ is, do people have such a hard time just being real and honest about themselves? Um, I, I, when you were talking to me, since I got the phone in my hand, I walked across my living room here because I have best reception here. And I've got a little forward in a book by Oswald Chambers called The Sermon on the Mount. And I love this quote. Um, this is from the publisher. And he's describing Oswald Chambers, who's been my friend for 47 and a half years. I started reading My Most for His Highest 47 and a half years ago. And I have read it almost, I would say, 99%. And I've never grown tired. But anyway, he says, for, for Chambers, the Christian life is authenticated, made real, actual, reality. The Christian life is authenticated when the indwelling spirit, the one who lives inside of me, applies the principles of Christ to the particular circumstances in which you and I are placed. He said, this is doctrine in work clothes. And one thing that has enabled me to be, I hope, hopefully, authentic and real, is that it's more than just information in my head, when God takes the principles and the things he speaks to me and makes them become reality in the everyday circumstances of life, um, he's just an authentic God. And when your sin is absolutely covered by the blood of Jesus, you don't have to fake, you don't have to make it up. <laughs> and I love authenticity. I love that it's real. Uh, I don't think I hate, I, I hate is a strong word, but I don't think I hate anything more than my own hypocrisy. I remember one time when the Holy Spirit said to me, he says, uh, you are prejudiced. Now, I played with a nine-piece black band. I had a black nanny as a little boy who mentored me. I, I, and I said, Lord, I'm not prejudiced. I, I love black folks. He said, no, no. I'm not talking about your prejudice to your own opinion. I said, what do you mean? He says, you are so stuck on believing you're right that many times when I wish to correct you, you refuse my correction. And you don't even hear truth because you just know you're right. Let me give you this one. This is a powerful um, DNA of my life. I learned long ago that the willingness to be wrong in order for God to be right is a humongous key to life. Because prejudice, I am so sure I am right that I can't hear anything else will get you so stuck up in religion and everything else. I am, even what I'm saying right now, I'm willing for God to come along and say, wrong, you missed it. Because in the end, he is the only one that is right. Now, some people say that's a great definition for humility. Well, I think it is. Pride says, I'm right. Humility says, I don't care about being right. Only God is right in the end. And that opens the door for authenticity. And, <laughs> and the hardest person to be authentic with 
is yourself. Boy, that's a big blank. <laughs> Can you talk about that last statement a little bit more, please? The hardest person to be authentic with is yourself. I, hey, I'll tell you what. I'll give you one authentic right now. This morning at breakfast, knowing I had this time coming, these pa- the several pastors came to my house yesterday as a visit. They I had wanted to see me. It was a, just happened to stop by. I happened to be here. It was a great time. And my wife said to me, she said, did you realize you interrupted them two or three times when they were saying something? You suddenly said, oh, yeah, yeah, let me tell you about this. She said, you interrupted them two or three times. And I felt like my wife had took a dagger, stuck it straight through my heart. Proverbs 13, verse 20. I hope I get that right. No, that's another one. Don't worry about where it comes from. But last year I was in Norway, and um, the Lord spoke this word to me. He says, to answer before listening is folly and shame. And God made me aware that I get so excited when I'm hearing somebody talk sometimes that I interrupt them before they finish. And I start telling them what I'm excited about. She said, you did that three times yesterday and never let them finish what they were going to say. And I thought, when am I ever going to learn? And I beat myself up right before this podcast so bad, I felt like calling you, Dave, and saying, look, man, I'm such a failure. I, I don't really feel like you should ask. I don't feel like doing this podcast. But then I remember that when I'm weak and I don't have anything and I know I'm a mess, but I'm God's mess and he loves me, um, I went ahead and did it. I'm not happy with myself right now. I wish I, I'm going to call one of the pastors back and apologize to him. Now, they probably weren't even aware, but my wife was. And that's where I am really thankful to have a mirror. My my wife is the in, most incredible mirror of truth to me because I don't see it, but she sees it. And she loves me enough to tell me truth. So I could have debated her. I could have fired back. But I took and said, you know, that's an area God's really working on. I don't know when I'm ever going to learn it. Well, I'm sitting here thinking three times. That's not bad. (laughs) To answer before listening is folly and shame. I think it's in Proverbs 18, 13. I'm looking it up now because somebody may want to look that up. But what I'm saying, if you're talking about authenticity, is that um, just that willingness to be wrong, and I could have argued about it. Yeah, it's in Proverbs 18, verse 13. To answer before, it's folly and shame. But the problem problem is that I read that, but it's not yet become my experience because I hadn't yet lived it out. (laughs) It's where the Lord's working on me. Ain't he great to work on us? (laughs) Well, there's so many applications to that. I mean, every relationship in our lives that's relevant, whether it's our marriage or our kids or people that we work with, that's a that's a big one for sure. Yeah, it is. <laughs> so if, people, if someone's listening to this and say, I'm not going to listen to that jerk anymore because, man, he just messed up so bad. Well, that's cool. You don't have to listen to me, but I would rather... Oswald Chambers has this thing called being broken bread and poured out wine. And at seven, almost 74 years of age, I feel like I'm needier for God than I've ever been. I feel like I make more mistakes than I've ever made. Well, not really, but that's the way I feel. And I realize that life has kind of come down to this place where I just need Jesus more than I've ever needed him before. When I was young, I didn't realize how much I needed him. A lot of what I did when I was younger, God blessed, it was fruitful, I had a great ministry, et cetera, et cetera. But I just did not realize how blind to so many things I was. Maybe, maybe, maybe what's going on with me is I'm getting closer to heaven than I've ever been. I've lived out probably 90% of my life. If I lived to be 81 or 82, I, would, I got about 10 years left. And what's happening is, is the authenticity of who he is and how fake and phony I can be 
rather than that being condemnation, it really just means, Jesus, I need you. And he began everything with blessed are the poor in spirit. And honestly, Dave, this is true. I think one thing that has driven me to find truth was I did not want to feel poor. I thought if I went to enough services and I read enough books and studied the scriptures enough that one day I wouldn't walk around this life feeling so empty and needy when actually it's the other way around. One day the Lord actually asked me, why do you keep trying to outgrow your need for me? He said, one thing that motivates you to keep studying and doing is not necessarily that you want relationship with me. It's you just want to, um, you don't want to feel needy. Get used to it. You, I, you are most blessed when you're most needy. And Jesus said of his own self, his own life. In John 5, Jesus said, in myself, I can do nothing. That blows me away that he emptied himself so much as God to become totally human so he'd be totally dependent on his Father for everything. And Jesus in himself did nothing. He, he said, I only do what I see my Father doing and I only say what I hear my Father say. And it, we have a hard time getting there, don't we? Because I, I want to go on my strength, but to be dependent on his, I think must be what the Christian life is all about. Yeah. Well, that's a great reminder because we always talk about the way the ways that Jesus was a model for us. But if we forget about that, and that he modeled actually being dependent on on God, and that's that is really powerful. Um, I wanted to get. I really. I know we, we're we're going a little long here, but I really want to get your thoughts on this this one other item, and that is, I've heard you said that. What the greatest miracle is to be healed from uh, I want to make sure I get this right hold on the greatest miracle of all is healing the pain of rejection and the human heart um, I really would love to hear what you have to say about that please well, well earlier in the brought, earlier in our time talking I told you about a man named Tom Watson and who was quite a, a, a brilliant thinker, a strong believer, and quite a writer. Um, he's actually buried under the log that he and I used to sit on and drink coffee and talk about Jesus right across the road from our homes. And, and it's on the Place for the Heart, right in front of the main building of the Place for the Heart is where Tom is buried, because that's where he mentored me for years. And Tom uh, helped me when I was asked by Chuck Colson personally in Greenville, North Carolina. I did the music for him when he was speaking there at Prison Fellowship. He'd gotten out of prison. He started a ministry called Prison Fellowship. And he asked me what I like to do, be a, a speaker for Prison Fellowship. And I said, yes. And he said, well, you need to come up with six main things you can teach when you go into prisons. So I employed Tom to help me with this. And I'll never forget Tom saying that uh, rejection was the greatest human hurt that could ever happen, that that is the most pain that a human being can ever suffer is, is to suffer rejection. And I started listening and thinking on that, and now I absolutely know it beyond a shadow of a doubt. To be rejected by another human being is the worst hurt of all. And that's the reason why when the Lord did the Ten Commandments and said, thou shalt not commit adultery, that the worst pain that I ever inflicted on my wife is I did commit adultery, which meant I prefer someone else over you. And it's, it's that spirit inside of her that says, was I not good enough to please you that you had to go get somebody else? That's rejection. And for her to forgive me of all that horrid rejection that I put on her, and not only forgive me, but to take me back as her lover, to take me back to have sexual, wonderful pleasure and desire with her, and for her not to remember the horrible adultery I did and committed against her. It's a miracle of God because she not only forgave me, she forgot it. She left it alone. Most people cannot 
get over it. And they feed the bitterness and hold on to unforgiveness. And and that is probably the most psychotic, worst depression thing that can ever happen to you, is to spend your life feeding your own mind and self all the bitterness against what someone else has done to you. But to be loose from that and to be able to forgive is the door to freedom. And the truth is, uh, yep. it began with Jesus forgiving me. I was the one that rejected him, and he turned. I, I, nobody has, I have, nobody's ever rejected me the way I have rejected Jesus. I did it my way. I mean, that's the song of the world. I did it my way. That sucks <laughs> because doing it your way is exactly what God said, that when you eat of this fruit, you shall, you know, the, the enemy said, when you eat of this fruit, you, you'll be like God's. Well, that was it. We traded relationship with God so we could be God. And that is, I was standing, I was, I was sitting in a street corner one day in Greensboro waiting for the light to turn, and there must have been six or seven people at that busy intersection begging for money and food. They were homeless, and the Lord spoke and said, I'm more homeless than any of those people. And I said, what do you mean? He said, I came to earth looking for a home, and I came to Israel, and oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, I would have gathered you as a mother hand gathers her chicks, but you would have no part of me. And Jesus said, I paid with my own blood the privilege of having a home and making my home inside of here. And so he understands rejection. I mean, we rejected the God of the universe. And what did he do about it? He died for us. If that isn't, if that isn't love, I don't know what love is. So, yeah, that's rejection. And, and to be accepted is... It's just the greatest thing. And I'm looking out my window as the clouds go by and realize that um, I'm still getting over it. <laughs> my little battle this morning, bumping in and interrupting those pa pastors. As soon as I get through, I can promise you this. One of them left his card. I'm going to call him on the phone and I'm going to say, I got to apologize to you. I interrupted you three times yesterday. And I'm sorry, my wife is so loving that she called me on it. But she didn't call me on it, too. She called me on it because she loves me. I, I, I love this verse, Proverbs 12.1. A man who loves discipline loves knowledge, but he who refuses correction is stupid. <laughs> I love it. Oh, God, I don't want to be stupid. Because I just want to receive the correction that she gave me. And, and because you love me, Jesus, you're always going to be correcting me. Not so I can walk around saying I'm right, but because I can say, wow, you've shaped me in your image. You've made me like yourself. I didn't do it. I, I have never been able to change me for good. It's God Almighty that has changed me for good, not me. I'm not big enough to do that. <laughs> yeah. All right. I'm I'm going to ask you one question specifically about work because that I try to bring every conversation at some point to the topic of work. Most of our listeners, you know, don't have a place for the heart ministry or or a, or our pastor, but they want to feel like um, they're living out their faith and living out God's purpose for them through their work. Do you have any any comments or? thoughts for our listeners on this topic of of seeing that seeing God and seeing uh, the spiritual in our work well you caught me with that one I don't I don't quite know what you mean by that would you just elaborate a little bit what do you mean like our daily work like what we do with our life or yeah getting up every day you know getting up every day and going to work um, how how can we live out our faith through our work? I, that's I got an answer. Hallelujah! God came through. I remember one time when I was in Australia. I was teaching a YWAM school in Brisbane, Australia, and the Lord spoke some something to me one day, 
And he said, anything that you do, that's work, that doesn't flow out of a heart of worship comes from the flesh. One more time. Anything I do that does not flow out of a heart of worship, I do it out of myself, out of my, my own flesh. And I spoke that in a class, and there was a girl there who came from millionaire parents in Germany. Her father had married a, a beautiful lady from Jamaica, took her back to Germany. This girl was rich. And she came up and she said, I have drawn, they, they cast lots and for the work details around that big school in Brisbane. She says, I have to get down on my knees and wash toilets and clean commodes and the bath. And we have servants to do it, that in our house in Germany. And it's degrading. You mean to tell me I'm supposed to do that out of a heart of worship? I don't believe that's possible. And I said, well, just keep doing it in flesh then. <laughs> and keep doing it in bitterness and anger and feeling sorry for yourself. But I can tell you this. If you can begin to worship God as you're doing that and clean those commodes to the glory of the Lord, you will be set free. And she walked away mad as can be. <laughs> and the day that I was supposed to fly out that afternoon, she rushed down. I heard somebody running down the steps, and she caught me out in the little foyer there. And she says, I got to tell you something. She said, while I was cleaning the toilet the other day, I discovered God. And I, I cried. She said, I actually was able to worship God while I was cleaning that come up. She said, thank you, thank you, thank you. That's what I'm talking about. And sometimes the most mundane task, like cleaning the commode or washing dishes or cleaning up behind somebody, which a mother does every day. A mother every day has to clean up behind her husband and the children unless the husband jumps in there to help her, which I'm trying harder to do. <laughs> but to do what we do out of a heart of worship transforms everything. So that's the best answer I can give you. It's a good one. And I know I put you on the spot on that. Sorry, but that's a great answer. I love it. Um, I love it. <laughs> do you have a favorite life verse or favorite scripture? Um, I probably have several, but I, I, I really love Psalm 37. I think it's verse three or four. It says, when we delight ourselves in the Lord, he will give to us the desires of our heart. And I, I, I truly love that verse. And I love Philippians two that says it's God who works in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Yeah, I love those verses, and they kind of go hand in hand. And uh, I could conclude when the day the Lord said to me, he said, the key to discipline is desire. And I said, what? He said, the key to discipline is desire. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, was it hard for you to learn to play piano? I bought an old upright $50 piano when we became Christians. And I'd taken a music theory course in college. But over the six months to a year, I learned and taught myself how to play piano. And the Lord said, was that hard? And I said, no, I loved it. He said, the key to discipline is desire. You wanted it so bad that the discipline was easy. And I've never had a, an art lesson in my life. I've got prints that have gone off. I've done many, many paintings. And that's how we supported the place in the heart for the first uh, eight or 10, 12 years. The monies that I made from the limited edition prints I did is how we built the buildings and built that ministry. And the Lord said, was that hard? I said, no, I loved it. He said, the key to discipline is design. So, yeah. That's good. That's good. Um, that could be our final thought, or unless you want to add one other final thought before we wrap up. Well, I could sum up the key to discipline is desire. When Jesus said, in Matthew 11, 27, 28, he said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Come, on to, come to me and, and learn of me that my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Meaning, in relationship with himself, he awakens. <laughs> I love this. It's the story of Sleeping Beauty. 
before Jesus, I was dead. And the prince came along and kissed me and rose, raised me from death into life. And I awaken with all this passion and desire. And my life is doing and living out what he has awakened inside of me. That's Jesus. And you got to love somebody to do that for you. <laughs> all right. If, if, it, if anyone wanted to um, learn more about you and your ministry, what you're doing, or reach out to you, what would you recommend? How would they do that? Well, you can look us up on the web and say Place for the Heart dot o-r-g if you do c-o-m you'll get a funeral home somewhere <laughs> <laughs> but a place for the heart not when you die a place for the heart is a place for the heart all small letters all the way through dot o-r-g and you'll get us and you can get in touch with me through the uh, all the information that's the simplest way i know thank you so much for your time ken i really enjoyed it well i hope it was meaningful to you thank you all right. You're you're, a, you're a good interviewer because you didn't interrupt me like I interrupted those pastors the other day. You let me talk. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're forgiven for those interruptions. Oh, thank you. I'll do 27 <laughs> hail Marys and I'll feel better about myself. Love you, buddy. Thank you. Love you too. Bye bye. Okay. Bye bye. Okay. Well, I told you Ken was a special kind of guy, and uh, as I'm sure you'd agree with me after that interview. Uh, I'm going to close out this episode with the song Potter and Clay, sung by Ken Helzer from his album Handmade at God's Farm. So take